Zach, Corey, and Dustin. What you do, guys do is amazing. I have enjoyed every single minute of it, and I mean that from my heart. Uh, you're professional, you're funny, you're great, and you got good character. All of you. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, hey Marshall. Okay, let's hey. click on some lights here so we can see each other. Looking How good. How are we doing, guys? Looking hey. good. Doing great. How are you? Great to meet you. Great to meet you guys, too. It's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really quick, Marshall. Sure. Dustin is my co-host for two dollar late fee and then Corey is my co-host for podcasting after dark and, and this is uh, going to be for our annual crossover episode uh previously <laughs> we covered um uh harley davidson and the marlboro man and the wraith and then this year for our uh, entire month crossover is going to be roadhouse wonderful wonderful yeah have, have you talked to any other people with roadhouse not yet, but Branscom Richmond, actually, you had posted a picture of Branscom on an episode of Renegade that you did. Yeah, he's a great guy. And I said to myself, I bet he was involved in Roadhouse somehow. And he was. He was a part of the stunt team in Roadhouse. Yeah. <laughs> he was in the big fight, uh, I think, in the first, and you know, first bar and then on down the line. He's well, a think, great guy. He's I think first. I saw Henry Kingy in that first bar fight, too, as well. Oh, and the first group before they came. Yeah, to. yeah, yeah. Before we get into Roadhouse, though, um, I think it's you've had a pretty phenomenal career as an actor. You've I've been I, blessed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you mind taking us back, kind of, to the inception of of what sparked the acting bug? Uh, you oh, know. oh, what starts? What's what started the acting bug? That's an interesting situation. I was a cop in Memphis. I was the deputy sheriff in Memphis. And, uh, you know, I had certain jobs that I was being given and one of them was uh, a little dark, let's put it that way. And I just thought, you know what, I don't want to really get shot. You know, I don't really want to get stabbed anymore. So I'll study acting. Maybe that'll get me out of it, you know. <laughs> so I studied acting and, uh, you know, and uh, went to, you know, Memphis Little Theater worked diligently, by the way, to keep it out of the ears of anybody that I was working with, you know, mm. especially my partners and <laughs> that kind of stuff. And, um, well, needless to say, one night they found me out. A friend of mine was covering for a guy whose wife was having a baby, and I was doing uh, Shakespeare in the round, believe it or not. You know, I was wow. And, yes. And I am not really good at I wasn't really good at that, believe it or not. I was a lot bigger than I am now, but I I was playing puck. And if you can imagine a 215 pound guy who lifted weights <laughs> five days a week running across the stage in green tights. That that was a that was a I'm just so happy they didn't have the phones they have today. Right. Back then, because had had they been back then, I would have been ruined. I would have never made it to Hollywood, you know. They would have just no. said, no way, man. I did the role. Uh, my partner was writing, and he, you know, they just said, let's go down and check out this group down here. We see a bunch of lights and stuff. We walked down there, and uh, about the time I entered, I came in stage right, you know, and just entered pounding across the ground there and uh, was trying to do um, – <laughs> Well, let's just put it, it's an English accent with a Southern draw at the time. And, so it's kind of uh, like uh, Kevin Costner then, I guess. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like Kevin. And my partner in the back, uh, well, the guy he was riding with said, you know, you're not kidding me, that guy is crazy. He said, you ought to ride with the son of a bitch. <laughs> so that started it. I came to Hollywood and um, I packed my truck. And I had everything I had in my, in my life was in that truck. Wow. I put in Bob Seeger and I drove to Los Angeles. Nice. <laughs> through the worst snowstorm that the Midwest had ever seen. Oh, man. Wow. At the time. Wow. Changed since then. They've had a lot of them since then. But at the time I came out, it was uh, it was theoretically the worst snowstorm, ice storm across the United States. Oof. What, what Bob Seeger were you listening to, by the way? 
Oh man, Hollywood Nights. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Slap it in, hit Hollywood. Every time I would get drowsy, I'd say, "Okay, something to pick me up." I'd hit Hollywood Nights. It'd wake me back up, and I would just keep driving. You know, I didn't want to stop in that snowstorm. Worst yeah. thing you can do is stop. Yeah, no. Yeah. You, know, you, you get to some whatever you can find that has a light, says rooms to rent. You know, or you know, stay overnight or stay by the hour, whatever it was, and you go in and you grab a room. You know, but. Uh, I went out and that was it. I mean, I went out and when I got to Hollywood, I looked around and paid the, um, I paid the custodian of the Howard Johnson's now, or it was the Howard Johnson at the time, Beverly Garland hotel. Mm -hmm. I paid him off in Jack Daniels and beer. <laughs> and he, he put up a cot in the, in the mop room and I slept in there. Wow. For about a week or so until I could find a place. And then it started. That's that's how I got started anyway. Everybody's got a story. Hollywood, as many actors are there, or, you know, every one of them have a story of how I got to Hollywood. And, Absolutely. And, you know, some of them are pretty, pretty nuts, you know, pretty nuts. Some of them just walk into it, you know, hey, I'm here. And they go, hey, where have you been? Let's put you in this movie. <laughs> well, that wasn't the case for Marshall. <laughs> and some people have to drive through a snowstorm and uh, sleep on a cot. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, all that kind of stuff. They, they thought I was a little raw, shall we say, to start out with. You know, uh, And I think that's how it, you know, I started out playing a lot of bad guys. And, uh, and still do. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still play bad guys. I love playing. Uh, I just play them with a different flair. Now, you know, you know, like Jimmy was a different flair of a bad guy. <laughs> needless to say <laughs> do you like are there any um bad guy roles that you look at for an inspiration or maybe better a better question is any perps that you know you encountered back in your days as an officer um did you like sort of draw from from those cast of characters i would rather go there than i would taking from people that i know are playing a role because i i watch them you know and a lot of them i can sit there and go he doesn't believe what he's doing. Yeah. And I don't think anybody can say, I don't believe what I'm doing when I play the characters. And I take that from people that I have known either in the military or when I was a cop or whatever. And I take it to where my head was at the time. And then I just go back and I find the little pieces and I just weave them together and make the characters. It's, it's a different way. How long were yeah. you a cop for? I was a cop for uh, four years, four, four, a little over four years. Wow. You know, and I got a couple of times uh, wrong place, wrong time, and uh, came away with a little extra weight on me. They fixed me up. I went back to work, you know, that usual thing. Same thing in the military. You know, you pick up some parts that you didn't have before. And you were in the Navy, right? Before uh, uh, being an officer, my stepmom was a dental hygienist at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. So I, oh, sort wow. of, she was I grew a, up around there. Wow, she was she was in the big land. She was yeah. where the, about officers and yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have, have you ever had a chance to to visit the Naval Academy I over have, there? I have, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a beautiful. And watching the young people there, you know, yeah, they walk around, uh, you know. Uh, they don't know me, don't know that I was, but I get a chance to watch them. And, and it's, it's pretty, imp it's very impressive to me. Yeah. I mean, they've had some things happen, like all the academies, all, every college that's out there has had something, you know, happen. But uh, I must say there's very little, very little that happens that uh, they don't take care of. Yeah. I mean, it's wrong. It's wrong. And, and if they catch you and it's really wrong, well, you're really going to pay for it. Yeah, we've got a few few family members went through there. So we're, we're I'm a Navy family. So go Navy. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Are you Thank blown you. away, though? Because I, I talked to my dad about this as well. Are you blown away by the the advancement of technology in the Navy? How when you were a kid in the Navy, how much are it you serious with that question? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I, we were diving with two tanks and two huge hoses that met in the middle and they're just rudimentary the suits we had were terrible but we thought they were great yeah mm -hmm. i mean the i mean they're swimming dragers right now and sdvs 
so, you know, sealed delivery vehicles and gosh, what they have today, the shoots they have today yeah. compared to what we had the, back in the time. I mean, I look at it and I just, I am amazed, truly, truly amazed at, you know, the weaponry. I don't know what to say. They get the latest and the greatest. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It truly is. I mean, they, they deserve it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, all the people that serve today are top notch. I mean, I never miss a day that I don't, when I say my prayers, I don't thank them mm-hmm. for their service. And I wish other people did. Yeah. Or hopefully they do. Yeah. But no, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very impressed with how they do their business. You know, I really am. Uh, I have no complaints, really. None whatsoever. Well, thank you, obviously, for your service. And you're more than welcome in the military and in the on the force. Uh, glad you're here with us. Surviving. You know and looking good. <laughs> I, I just want to it's a it's a rough segue, but uh, I had sent a clip to the guys before we went online uh, of you as a Mace Petty from uh, first and ten. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> and you're playing a song in that in this episode, in this clip that I sent them. Um, I have a very warm place in my heart for that television series. I thought it was a really kind of ahead of its time in a way. Oh, very um, much so. Very and, much so. And we you were, were the first series that had that different flair that was yeah. on uh, HBO. I mean, we were the first that had the difference. And people, some people liked it, some people didn't. But that's, you know, that was because it was so new. Delta Burke working with Delta. I love Delta. Love Delta. She's such a class act. Yeah. I mean, truly a class act. And she's married to a class act. So that's right. And Gerald McCraney, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There's some. There's I think some... they live in Florida now. They finally got their place in Florida and they are happy as two squirrels in the nest. You know, they're just, <laughs> they talk about their back porch and they talk about the water. And they tell me, and we've got a gator, and he sits out there in the lake. And I'm sitting there going, well, you know, those little dogs of yours, you make sure you know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, just to back it up for a second, sure. you, you arrive in Hollywood. Your uh, resume has some Memphis community theater, a little Shakespeare. Yes, uh, what? How hard was it to really establish yourself, get an agent, and start going out for the roles that you wanted to go out for? That's a very interesting question. It was exceedingly difficult at first. I went around to people, I studied, I, uh, there was a, a teacher out there that I started with. Her name was Estelle Harden. And uh, I started with her, matter of fact, Chuck Norris started with her. You know, she's been around, she was around for a long time. And I knocked on the doors and asked them, you know, hey, I'm doing town, this is my, do you have any eight by tens? I'm working on that, do you have a resume? And I'm working on that. Well, as soon as you get those things, come back and see it. It was a lot of that. Right. Until I met Betty McCart. Betty McCart was the agent for uh, Tom Selleck Mm. forever. I mean, she was, I I think she was agent for him for 25, 30 years until she obviously passed away. God rest her soul. But she was a great lady. And I just, I asked her and she basically said no, but I knew there was something there. I mean, she knew me. She liked me. And no problem. There wasn't any question there. I was, I was doing work in Bel Air where I was bodyguarding different people, you know, uh, celebrities, uh, people, um, you know, just let's just say people that had a lot more money than I did. <laughs> but I, I took care of them, and I, and Tom, I met Tom, you know, through friends and neighbors, and invited, and I met Betty, and I, we met several times, and I kept asking her, and she said, Marshall. I love you. You're a sweet guy, but no, you just don't have what it takes. Mm. You don't have the stuff yet. Mm. And then she came home one day and I had a tent pitched in her front yard. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> yes, I did. No, you didn't. What? I really? pitched a tent in her front yard. People that drove by her house thought it was a little bit crazy or she had grandchildren over there. <laughs> you know, but, but there was this grown man that kept was sitting outside in a chair with a little stove because I I survived on that little stove. <laughs> wow, cooking his meals, you know, that you could buy 
you know what I'm talking about, the dehydrated meals where you yeah. do the water and you eat and that kind of stuff. She came home one night, you know, and she looked at me and she said, Marshall, what, what, what are you doing on my front yard? <laughs> and I said, well, Betty, uh, it's funny you should. I'm glad you noticed me here. <laughs> it's kind of hard not to. Right. She says, what, what are you doing? I said, I thought I would come here and prove to you that I have what it takes because I really want you to be my agent. Hmm. And she laughed and she she said, whatever, okay, I'm going <laughs> to the house, you do what you, you know, you know, oh, I, I can't. I slept there all night and I was up the next morning when she came out. I'd made my coffee. I was drinking a cup of coffee and, <laughs> you know, oh, oh, cowboy stuff, you know, but she, she said, you're serious. I says, yes, ma'am, I am serious. She says, my God, you're also nuts. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am, I'm nuts too. She said, would you show, go, go home or go wherever you have, get on some <laughs> clean clothes, please come by the office, you're signed. And by the way, take your tent. <laughs> <laughs> take your stuff with you. <laughs> that was that, that was my first agent, and uh, and of course, it's I, I was with her for a long time, and then obviously, you know, they come up and they say, you know, look, we've done all we can do, you know, we, you know, find somebody else or whatever, and that's just normal. I mean, that happens all over, and you move on to your next agent, and your next agent, and your next agent. So you move along until you find a place you call home. And you call it home, but uh, that's how that's how the process works. I never knew that. So you sort of plateau with. Sometimes you can plateau with an agent, and then kind of have to. Well, that's kind of what it is. I mean, they they'll send you out for. They get an idea of what you are, and it's and it agents are like casting directors. I mean, they're they really have a, kind of a short vision, in some cases. There are some people they don't have. I mean, there are people that come in there that are, oh, yes, and this, and oh, this, and oh, that. And they do they do the soliloquy of whatever. And uh, I couldn't do that hmm. at the time. Yes, I could do it now. But uh, I, I didn't, I couldn't do it then. So, yes, you do. They, they send you out for as much as they can send you out for. And they take all the, and I, I didn't bug them. You know, there's a lot of actors that will bug their agent, you know, and say, what do you got? Anything new? I would call in occasionally and ask them. I said, you know, I'm not bugging you, just asking. Hmm. And it would get to a point they really didn't have anything. So, you know, they pat you on the butt and say, going down the road, you do. I've been very blessed, though. You said I had a, a good career, and I have had a great career. I'm doing another, I've got another movie I'm starting in October, you know, and it's, it's called Delivery Fee. It'll be a fun, it's a fun movie. And it's my first comedy movie. Yay. That's great. Cool. Yay. 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 <laughs> you know, I've, I've played a lot of serious roles and not so serious, you know, I've, but I've played, a, you know, I, now I can sit there and say, I have played a spectrum of characters. Yes. You which have. I'm very pleased with. Um, first, all right. what, I think I've got some notes here myself because I can't remember them all. It's okay. <laughs> first, we, we'll, we'll, yeah, we're happy really, to help I too. I really can't remember. You <laughs> said I have quite a, a selection of shows on my resume, and I do yeah. to the point I can't remember them all. <laughs> I mean, did you expect us to bring up First and Ten? I don't think you did. No, I did not. You actually got me on that one. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I don't know if people know what the character was, but his character was name was Mace Petty. Yeah, and he was a streaker. <laughs> the character I played was a streaker. He had a thing about every once in a while just dropping his drawers and running across somewhere naked <laughs> <laughs> or taking a shower with a naked cheerleader or whatever it was he did. But the movie was that kind of that TV show was kind of that that kind of show. Yeah. And we were playing with real football players. You sure were. The, I mean, when they hit you, you knew you were hit. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yep. Luckily, I was not a, I was not necessarily a small person. And I knew the guys, you know, uh, one of them, I think you guys know, Tiny Zester, he's passed away now. Yeah. He was a great, he was a great guy. He was a great guy. But uh, for instance, first time we're talking about the first time you get the, the, the woman. Well, that was on Hunter, I believe. And that's a long time ago. <laughs> but I got, I got the lady in that one. I think she passed away, unfortunately. 
And then there was, I think, um, what was the next one? Uh, oh, 18. I got the girl in that one. And, you know, there were several others along the way. And it that's the changes you were talking about. Yep. When you asked me about, you know, were you solid into this bad guy? Yes, I was. Until somebody um, or a casting director said, you know, I'm going to bring Marshall in for this because I think he can do the role. He's got he's got the looks. So let's bring him in and see if he can do the role. And I got it. You know, so it was a it was a slow process, but a great process. Well, in keeping with, you know, sort of more of your bad guy roles early on on TV, um, sure. we are a big fan of the werewolf TV show from Fox. We actually did on uh, um, podcasting after dark. We did an entire episode on that show. Um, and we also have a fan, one of a Patreon for both podcast after dark and to our late if he David Ullman, he loves the show as well. Um, do you have any memories about working on that called, show? I think it was called Werewolf. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah Werewolf. It, and the episode you were on was episode 27. Um, I actually have the French DVD box set because oh you can't, my God. You oh can't my even God, look at that. You can't even get it in America because there's too yeah. many licensed songs on it. So I had to order this from France. Uh, you're on episode 27 of uh, Flying Face. Yeah, it. it costs more to ship it than to buy it. Um, uh, and you were on uh, episode Blind Faith with the uh, yes. the the blind lady. Uh, and yes. You were kind of like a, a con man type of thing. Yes, but I was. I you was were great. Another... You were great in that episode. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And the guy that played the werewolf was a very handsome, wonderful guy. Yep. Yeah, John were... J. York. Yeah. Yeah. And the werewolf was a badass. I mean, let's yeah. just I think he ripped my face well, off. Or... Well, <laughs> he, so I, I... he ripped your he ripped your throat out. So you got your throat ripped in, in, in to a road, Roadhouse I, and I the werewolf. Had a lot of work done to it over the years. <laughs> but he was he was charming. He really was a charming young man. The show was great. Uh, I played, I think, three werewolves so far. Oh, wow. Uh, I played another. I played a werewolf. Yeah, make sure to do that. Actually, I played two werewolves. One was on the People Next Door, and it was a comedy show about uh, a guy that was afraid of he was afraid of ghosts and everything else in Halloween. And I just happened to be the werewolf that <laughs> he opened up his shower, and I'm in there showering. I've got my power cap on, and I've got my face on, all this other stuff, and that was funny. And then there was. Um, there was another show, and I'm trying to think of what it was. Uh, excuse me if I don't get the names right, but it, all good. I did play a werewolf in that one. I, I did the first TV morph, oh, the okay. first on TV. You know, it's interesting when an actor can look at you and say, "Yes, I did the first morph that was ever done on television." You know, and that's kind of an unusual thing to hear, and you really have to go back. Yeah. It is. You know, years to find that. And it was, and the lady that did uh, the makeup for it was a lovely person uh, and did this beautiful werewolf head on me. And I got the role because they brought me in. They said, what do you know about wolves? I said, actually, I know quite a bit about wolves. What do you want to know? <laughs> I showered as one. I was murdered I was by one. Yep. I did. This is why I had my got throat, my throat ripped, ripped out by one. <laughs> I got them all and got the role and played it. And it was fun. It really was. So the the effects on this morph obviously were much more advanced. And when you say morph, you're talking well, about. Well, I can't say I can't say advanced because you had to stand as they turned you. You literally had to stand frozen, because the machine worked at such a slow pace. Now they just hit a button, da 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 da, boom, you're a werewolf. Yeah, yeah. Back then it was a whole thing of the slide and bringing this behind it and make the two come together and then you're a werewolf. So you're standing still for about, I mean, to do it for the machine, it took about five minutes of standing perfectly still and not moving while they did this. Then when they did the show, boom, you're a werewolf. So the process of electronically, you talked about, you know, the military of the past, the military of the future, right. man, you're looking at, you know, being in a cave, basically, and working with you know rudimentary mechanics to today, where they tap two buttons and you're a werewolf. Yeah. I mean, it's really amazing. Yeah, you know, that that kind of change that goes into making something like that. Yeah, it's 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 uh, 
we we always pay respect to the fact that the groundbreakers who started this stuff in the 80s and the 90s where it was very challenging very difficult it might not look as good as it may today but way back late when late, I, I go back late 70s right you know, right late 70s and that, you know it was late 70s but yeah when you see that you're absolutely right I, you have to sit there and pay you know homage to them because they did some amazing stuff with not a lot of technology right right you know so you've really seen like the improvements of technology on, especially on TV and stuff. I feel like TV's improved so much since it was back in the eighties and everything yeah. like that, you know, shows like war of the worlds and stuff. You could just tell the budget was what it was, but I mean, you've seen in your, in your working life, the, the changes that the, the industry has made over the course of time and everything. Yes, I have. I mean, the cameras they used to use back when I started were enormous right and the big reels that came on them i mean then you know and they got smaller and then you went to the red that was the first time yep. i ever did you know a digital show i came up we're doing this digital i went you're doing this what <laughs> we're doing this digital. what at all yeah because with the red they i think they finally figured out how to sort of emulate that film look that 24 frames a second look and not yep. that hyper real hd look that that has no motion blur whatsoever yeah that the red was a, a ground uh, a game changer oh it was amazing it was an amazing camera the first ones uh we did a show we did a a novella i guess yeah. it's a novella it was a it was a uh, you know it was it was kind of it was a coin phrase it was kind of a cast made off of you know the mexican soap opera the novellas and we did 65 episodes you know and i was when i got the job i was leaving for iraq so i told him i said i'm going to be out of town for about three weeks do you need me to ride off I said no we're going to be shooting this we can do this he said what if you die i said write me out get somebody else you know but they kept it i flew in my third first day they handed me a script said here's your work for tomorrow and the work for tomorrow was 35 38 pages Whoa. that's what i had to do my mm. first day back from Iraq. Wow! Yikes! So you were still in the in the Navy when you were acting? No, I, I went over. I went over there. Um, uh, Chuck Norris and I went over there. No, I was out by then. I, I was, but they had, they had asked us to come once before, and we were ready to go, and then couldn't go because they said, "No, we got a little thing going on," and that was bringing down Saddam Hussein. Little thing. And they said, little "Come thing. now." <laughs> yeah. So you know, we went over then, and. Uh, spent the time and uh, about three weeks we were over there and they were amazing you know amazing people and in their country they were amazing and then came back and went to work the day i touched the ground wow so was this this was a tour to for the troops to kind of just you know uh what like uso kind of thing well it, it was kind of sponsored by the uso but we went uh we flew over with the uh on the secretary of the navy's plane with general uh yeah, Magnus. Uh, he was the assistant commandant uh, of the Marine Corps. Wow. Okay. So we didn't really go with USO. We went with him. Yeah. But we had a, a little USO hat we wore every once in a while. <laughs> but we, we, you know, the rules were for us, you know, we didn't go over there to entertain because Chuck and I looked terrible in a cheerleader outfit. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, um, it's, it's kind of. But we went over to see the troops. We said, we want to go where no one has gone before. Oh, boy. We want to go to the, the fobs where nobody, no political anything has gone. Yeah, yeah. And we want to see those troops. So we ended up 17 different fobs, got okay. shot at, dropped hmm. bombs on us, whatever. You know, <laughs> Holy cow. Went did our job, then came back, went to work. Wow. Went back to 38 pages on a... <laughs> Walked in, you're just work. <laughs> you're just reading it the the whole flight over, huh? You know, coming back. No, I no, I hit the ground. They handed it to me. Oh, oh, oh wow, <laughs> wow. Go home, get some rest. This, this is what you do tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> you're like, you whoa. <laughs> We're gonna pick you up at six thirty in the morning. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> and that was shot on a red. So you know they had, it was a very weird setup. You had, you know, you had pieces from I don't know how many scripts in one day. It's 35 pages, but it's not all in the same script. So they would shoot everything, have the camera one direction. They would shoot that direction till they finished those pages. 
then they would flip the camera over and you went back and you had to do it again from the opposite direction. Very difficult to do. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Was your, was your relationship with Chuck Norris, um, did you guys meet through martial arts or through acting? Yes. No, it was martial arts. We met through martial arts. I don't know how many years ago we figured we have talked about it so many times and we figured we just cut it off at 45 years. <laughs> I think you do that. Aren't you supposed to do that in general? <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, we've known each other. We know each other. He said, let's just go to 45. We know it's that. Okay. We got it. <laughs> so we just say 45 years, but he was always, a, he was always a good man. He was a gentleman fighter. Yeah. You know, and you don't understand what a gentleman fighter is. Do you? Would you please uh, explain that? You, for our you, show us. Uh, <laughs> he could knock you out, you know, and come over. If you went down, he'd help you up. If you didn't go down, you're up against the ropes tied up. He'd come over. Are you okay? You all right? He'd slap you around a little bit. Yeah, I'm fine. He said, you want to continue? I said, when I can see one of you, yes, we'll go back and fight. Oh, man. <laughs> it's hard enough fighting one Chuck Norris, fighting two. Exactly. I think there's Ask a, Richard yeah. about it, too, when you say, because he'll tell you, you know, Chuck's a tough guy. Yeah. He's a tough guy. But well, I, but a but always a gentleman. I will I will say I, I've said this before on the show. Um, the first chapter book I ever read cover to cover in third grade was his autobiography. In fact, I still have it, and I used to put it in my back pocket when I go to concerts and uh, pull it out in between sets. And people would say, "Are you reading a book about Chuck Norris?" And go, "Yeah, it's amazing." It's my second or third time I've read this book. Um, I read it a couple of times myself. It's it's fascinating. It's inspiring. It's all those things. Um, but there's some parallels there, right? You know, in in the sense that you, know, you guys came out together, not the same time, obviously. And no, no. But but and then went on to work together on Walker Texas Ranger. Oh yeah, I mean, I did more than any actor in Hollywood. I, I think I did nine. Yeah, I, I think I think it was nine different episodes through the years you know first to the last and then we did a movie afterwards and i was in that and it was, right. it was it was it was great it was great to do that but to do it with your friend i mean the person you care about he is your friend yeah i mean I, in hollywood the word friendship is a very loosely used yeah terminology i'm sure oh, totally. you guys know that yeah <laughs> i don't call many people my friend right i can say that i have had a handful and I mean, literally, a handful of what I consider very close friends in Hollywood. A couple of them are dead mm. now, you know, but they are still remain as much a part of me today as they were then. I care about them so deeply. Mm. So that's what a, a true friend means in Hollywood. And would you say that there's a connection there being a martial artist? It seems like the martial art community in Hollywood tends to be very tight. There's a camaraderie there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not with everybody. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to name names, but we could. Non-gentleman non fighters. There are a few out there, but for, for instance, Richard and Judy, I love them to death. I mean, what are you going to say? I have to actually thank the world of them. I'm, they mean a lot to me. Chuck's the same way. Gina, the kids, everything. Those, that's what they mean to me. Those are friends of mine. Those are dear friends of mine. I, I thank the world of them. You know, there, not many actors can say that. They really can't. No, you have a relationship on set, and then the shoot's over, and you're done, and never see that person again. Or you, or, or you go to a show or uh, an award show, and, oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah, and they kiss and hug and everything else and who was that i don't know you right. know they turn and they walk off <laughs> but yeah. you know the feet, well, you know that you've seen them do it yeah i've yeah. had it happen to me not an award yeah. show but a, i mean it's hard life? enough to find genuine friends in in you know normal life let alone in such a unique job like acting when you're with somebody for so long and everything i'm sure it's nice enough just to be able to work with somebody nicely let alone actually building a bond and a friendship, which also takes effort and work. And you guys are all busy. Like, you know, actors are busy people and it's a not a nine to five style job. So like actually taking the time to maintain a friendship is just as difficult as anything else. I imagine more so as an actor. Yeah. I'd, I'd say without question. I can't, I can't even argue that point with you. It is very difficult, but when you find the person that means that much for you, 
you put in the work. You make the they, time. Yeah. They put in the work. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 something that's pretty cool. I want to I want to roll back a little bit to what Corey said in that you got your throat ripped out by a werewolf and then flash forward to Roadhouse where you get your throat ripped out out by Dalton and uh, Patrick Swayze <laughs> and and I were you were you did, in that did you say this happened in werewolf <laughs> <laughs> we can't rip off werewolf not guys. again <laughs> not again oh, no Here we go again I'll, I'll lean your head back. Right, that's it. <laughs> You're like, I know this feels all normal to me. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you get a uh, good makeup artist or a good surgeon is a good, you know, person to fix your throat up. I mean, that that, that line, you know, you go places, people, how's your throat? Oh, they did a good job. <laughs> right. <laughs> when Patrick did that and we did the show, you know, the, um, it had to flow into the fight. Yeah. You know, the fight was very tumultuous to say the least. And uh, he said, you know, we talked about it. I mean, this, I think they did that one on the, the fifth night. And it was, I think the last shot of the fifth night we did that fight. I think oh, it was the fifth man. night, fifth or sixth. And we were bruised all the crap. We were bruised, beat up, you name it. We were we were that. And uh, Patrick said, I'm going to come around, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to catch you right here. I'm going to rip your throat out. And you can't, and you have to spin because they already had the throat there. He was going to pull it. The makeup artist had put him something to get his fingers in. So when he pulled back, that was my throat. So it all had to work at one time. And the reason for that was the sun was just hitting just starting to crack, you know, on on the hillside. It was just starting to crack. We had to get that shot. We had fought all night long. We were beat to crap. And he said, I'm going to rip your throat out. I said, go for it. Please <laughs> do it. <laughs> rip go for my it, throat out and <laughs> kick me in that water. It's cold, but kick me in the water and get rid of it. It looked cold. It was. I won, I won money on that, by the way. How? I won five hundred dollars on that. How? I'm serious. Bet you can't stay in the water for five seconds. That's what, what is... exactly <laughs> what they said. They no said, way. They said when you hit that water, he's gonna come out of that water like nobody's business. And I turned around, I looked at him, and said, "Gentlemen, I made my living in the water." <laughs> yeah, man. I said when I hit that water, I'm not gonna move. Amen. And the water and was 43 degrees. Oh, wow. That was the temperature of that water I hit. And I laid there. Oh. Until they pushed me out and let me float through camera. Wesley! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great scene. I'm in a unique position. I am, I'm an 80s kid, but it, Roadhouse missed me. And I watched that movie for the first time yesterday. Um, and it's a great <laughs> scene. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, yeah, exactly. no, I know. It, it, it's it's weird. I know, guys. <laughs> but as a as a forty five year old man, I can say this movie's awesome. Like it's awesome, and that fight scene was fantastic. What I loved was after you know uh, he, Dalton kills your character. Like I like how Kelly Lynch goes straight for you and not you know to check on her boyfriend. I thought that was really realistic, and because she's a uh, doctor in it. But you were face down in that drink the entire shot. When she went running by, and and I mean, it's a full shot. There's no cuts or anything. And to what you're saying, how cold it was, now that makes that shot even more impressive because you were just in it face down. Yeah, well, they, when she rolled me over, I couldn't do anything. Yeah. I couldn't go. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so cold. Right. Yeah. She rolled me over. She looked at me, and then she got up and walked out, and I went, <sighs> you know, like that. <laughs> but and I, and I, when they cut the scene, I said, pay me. <laughs> <laughs> but Absolutely. also too i mean that scene works because your character was so believably bad during yeah. the entire movie and and it's just you know i mean like to the point where you have to accept that the good guy is willing to kill you now of course you know you pulled out the gun and everything that kind of gives them that justification but it was your selling of the badness that really kind of i mean your character is great i thought he was awesome thank you I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I bet. I bet. <laughs> Did you enjoy um, 
there's a huge musical component to Roadhouse with Jeff Healy and, and and into the point where, you know, he is literally he 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 he's a huge part of this film. Filming those scenes, what can you can you kind of go back in time? And was that a, was that fun to shoot those scenes with a live band and, uh, and all oh, that stuff? I can't even begin to tell you how cool that was. Right. I mean, Joel Silver. Blessing brought in Jeff Healy band. You know, of course, I think uh, you know Patrick knew of him too. Yeah, and his wife and everything. But they brought in the Jeff Healy band, who I'd never seen before. Okay, first time I the first time I'd ever seen him. And I mean, during lunch, everybody go get lunch. Jeff Healy band would go eat their lunch, and they'd go up get their instruments on. And what they allowed him to do, and they did it every day. We came back. 15 minutes of music. Wow. They would just sit in there and play for 15 minutes oh. every day. And I can guarantee you that nobody, nobody went to the truck unless it was an absolute emergency that they had to have a party or something. But everybody came in after lunch and, or we sat around and they played. And I mean, they rocked the house every single day. And to be a part of that. I mean, it was great. I mean, they had a chair set up and some people had to go to makeup. Makeup was doing makeup while they were playing because they wanted to be for the music. That is so cool. That is so <laughs> cool. Awesome. And what I love about the movie itself is that the band literally never stops playing. It doesn't matter what's happening in the no. bar, who's getting <laughs> thrown into what, who's like, there's blood everywhere. And bottles like, bouncing. Off. Bottles <laughs> bouncing. Right. And they never stop. There's never a record scratch. There's never a, whoa, maybe we should get, okay, no, just keep playing. They just didn't stop. No, the Titanic, they, go down with it. It was, it was, it was pretty, pretty, you know, people, I'm glad you saw that. I'm glad you saw that because a lot of people miss that point. Hmm. They would say, yeah, there was a lot of music, but they forget that those guys played through everything. Everything. <laughs> everything. You can have a riot going on and they'll play. They don't give a dang what's going on. I mean, if somebody's in a, if they're in the middle of, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. And they, you know, they, they started, once they start playing, they play. Of course they would stop it when they'd say cut, you know, but, of course. <laughs> but at 15, 15 minutes, they just, uh, Jeff would get up there and he said, anybody got any, anything they want to hear? Or do you just want to let us rock? I said, let them rock. Wow, that is and so they cool. Just, they did it every day. It was wonderful. That's got to be a, such a unique experience. It was. It was. There was a, a lot of people came to set, you know, to obviously grab a meal because Tony's was doing it. You know, Tony was doing the food and the food was excellent. And um, but they knew the music was going to be there or their friends. So they just show up. People come in, you know, I'm not working today. What are you going to do? I'm going to eat, listen to music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, watch a few scenes and go home. So you you can't beat that. I don't think anything's ever uh, come close to that. Or I don't think anything's ever been like that before. Uh, there's there's Never heard a couple it. movies that come to mind in the future that are similar in in that sense of having <clears throat> in having a, a live band playing music while the chaos is going on. Clearly an homage to Roadhouse. I, I think one specifically is from Dusk Till Dawn. I think that's called yeah. Reimagined, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. the, new, the new Roadhouse is called. And I, I look, I, I wish him well. I really do. I wish him well. I, it's, it's, you know, when they first came out, it was, what was it? They were doing Roadhouse and everybody said, no, no, you're not doing yeah. Roadhouse. And then we're going to do a, a takeoff of Roadhouse. No, you're not doing that. <laughs> Right. Then they say, we're doing a Reimagined. Roadhouse and everybody went. Okay, hey, hey, hey. yeah. Right. Show me what you got. So yeah. uh, they've got some excellent actors in there. I mean, they really do. Well, you you can roll back to Roadhouse too, and someone excellent in that film being Richard Norton was in Ro Roadhouse too. That's he the only Roadhouse highlight of that too. film. He was in Roadhouse too, and he made the dang movie. I totally agree. He made the movie. Yep. Because the rest of it. I can't go there. No. <laughs> Interesting. I, I would like you to go, though, to a place of uh, reflecting on t working with Terry Funk in that film, because uh, we are 
I, I unabashedly am a huge wrestling fan, especially Texas wrestling. Uh, Paul London is a, is a buddy of ours and he, he and I do a wrestling show. Actually, I do three podcasts, a wrestling show as well. And, uh, um, <laughs> you got me, you got me. And Terry Funk, obviously, you know, he's, he's got, uh, he's, he's mean, mean old bastard in that as well. Uh, working with Terry Funk. How was that? <clears throat> the, <laughs> besides the fact that he's a big strapping, tough look, mean, he's got one of the softest voices you've ever heard when he gets into his talking voice. He sure does. Hey, yeah. Hey, <laughs> Terry, why do you sit there and go to Japan and get blown up with dynamite in the crowd? I was, well, I got to take care of my babies. I got babies at home. I got to take care of the babies. Okay, Terry. Terry just, it, Terry's a lot. My wife, Lindy, who's in the next room over here, but she is a huge, huge wrestling fan. Oh, okay. She was brought, her dad brought her up through Haystack Calhoun, all these great wrestlers. Uh, you know, pick one. The Von Erichs, what's, perhaps? What's the one you like so much for? <laughs> yeah, Superfly Snooker. You guys oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And jump off the thing and boom, bash you like it. Well, that is that is like, she go, she'll, <laughs> she's done that on me a couple of times. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I was snoring or something, and she goes, whap, right here. <laughs> you can share with her. Oh, go ahead. You can <laughs> share with her that my, uh, that my mom's PE coach, growing up in Detroit was George the Animal Steel. And he would go and he would wrestle at night, but he would also be a PE coach during the day. <laughs> Did you hear that, Boo? That is, that is <laughs> cool. It's like, that's awesome. <laughs> right? So um, <laughs> so obviously, yeah, Terry Funk, you know, is a, is a living legend, a Texas legend. Um, and then, you know, working with Ben Gazzara, you're working with possibly a masterful actor. Did you pick up techniques with him or like, did he take you under his wing as a mentor? Because he's like your father figure in that as well. Well, he, I looked at him, I uh, had to look, I looked upon him as my father figure because he got me, you know, when I got out of prison, he knew I was in there and that kind of thing. So I watched him for about three days. I didn't go up and introduce myself to him or anything. I, he didn't know who I was or anything else. I stayed off and I just watched him for three days. Watched him get on the set, you know, the old Hollywood makeup. This I need this. Get this. My bad. You know, I I need a drink. I need I need something here. Of course, and he's doing this <laughs> off and on. And I was watching people. You know, these young PAs. You know, and they were oh yes sir, and they'll get it. And I went over and I said, if he, if he keeps that up, he's going to drive them nuts. Right. So I went up to him and I said, hey boss, I'm Jimmy. I'm here to take care of you. And that's, let me know why are you sitting out here in the sun. Love that. Chair needs to be under the tree. So do you mind if I move your chair back under the tree? Stay in the shade, stay out of the sun. You're going to bake. And what do you got to drink here? You don't have anything to drink. What do you want? You don't go to these, you don't go to these little worms. You come to me. You need something. You say, Jimmy, and I'll get it. So that was my way of introducing myself to him. Love it. That's awesome. I, I, I never told him my name was Marshall. He finally looked it up he came up to me and said your name's not jimmy <laughs> <laughs> i said you're right sir it's not but there was no reason for you not to call me jimmy right that's he bad. says i like it i like it we're gonna keep it <laughs> you know <laughs> drag me in from all over the place you know jimmy come over jimmy you know it's always jimmy so it, it made the show move and it, it gave it life yeah, gave no him life and he's brilliant he is truly brilliant but uh, super nice guy. For years after the show was over, I'd run into him or I'd see him at a grocery store. They'd say, Jimmy, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Jimmy. <laughs> you, you just can't, you just can't, you can't buy that. Well, yeah, that, that film has. You can't a, buy that relationship. No, you, you, and you, but you were the one who made it happen. Though. You made I, that happen. I watched him. I watched him. I watched where he was insecure. Mm. Mm. And you find people that shout at people and say this and that because they are insecure. Right. When you put yourself and you stand in front of me, you look at him and you, you look at him and say, boss, 
I'm Jimmy. And why are you sitting in the sun? Hmm. Well, I was, this is, this is where my seat. No, you didn't, you didn't ask me. You need to get over here in the shades. I need to get you out of the sun. I don't know what you're baking in the sun, boss. What do you want to drink? Yeah. Have you had lunch? You want something to eat? So I said, I'll be here. You need something. I'm going to be here. All you have to do is say, Jimmy. He never talked to another PA that entire film. Wow. Not one time did he ever talk to a PA. That's a. That's... He, would come, he would come to me and say, Marshall, I got to get to makeup. I said, well, come on, let's go. That's a Marshall, very can you pick my dog up and, <laughs> and uh, whatever my dry want. cleaning is uh, ready? Uh, Jimmy. But, you know, when it came to the movie, it was whatever he wanted. But he knew, he finally figured out what I was doing. Didn't take him long, really. But he, understood, <laughs> he understood what I was doing and why I was doing it. And he just went right along with it. That's so cool. You know, he just, that's, that's something that, that you know, they, they would call me to the set whether I was working or not, if he was working. Because I would be next to him. And that's the that, way it works. Did you get that factored into your salary too? So. <laughs> no, no, that, that was that was that was pretty young in my career at that time, you know. And, but you well, were, I wouldn't though. say it was young in my career, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the point I was trying to make when we first opened up the interview is that you, you know, up until eighty nine or eighty eight when you filmed that, uh, you your body of work was impressive. It continues to be impressive. Like your your career that we've often said this to many actors on our show uh, that it's such a short, it's such a finite possibility of getting to be on screen the chances of that happening and when you have that whether it's one role or 250 the fact that you have this work that is forever on tape on dvd blu-ray Somewhere. digital whatever how special is that that is uh, remarkable hats it, off it, to you man that's that's no that's you put it as you put it as well as I've tried to explain that to people in different venues or or you know interviews and for the most part most people don't get it no they don't get it and I say I have been I've said that before you heard me say I'm blessed I am blessed because people go I mean you have no idea how many people come there every day to get a job. Right. And some of them get jobs because they've got great bodies and they don't mind taking their clothes off and doing whatever. But after that show's over or two shows is up, that's it. You won't see them again. Yep. Mm -hmm. You ask, where's so-and-so? The one that did the, the thing about Bob over here. And they go, who was that? I've never been, a, I've, I, I, cl I never, I've never been a, uh, I've never been an A actor, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not classified as an a, a class actor, but I'm an actor that they bring on all the time. Why? They bring me on to do something because they know that once I get locked to that A actor, he and I are going to bond and his work is going to go sky high. Yeah. Cause I'm going to make him go there. Carlos did that. A oh, Chuck, excuse me. Chuck did that. He did it because he said, I'm a, he said, I'm a movie star. That man is an actor and a damn good one. Hmm. I said, when he comes on, he makes me step up my game. And, uh, you know, which is a hell of a compliment. Yeah. And I've gotten that from a lot of people. And it's to me, I look at it when they say it, I take it with the utmost gratitude. And I mean that sincerely. I mean, when somebody says, it's because of you. My my work was so good on that. You wow. helped me get there. Yeah, it shows that you're a team player. You know, you, you're looking at the 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 movie as a whole as opposed to your own personal ego. You know. Well, I mean, ego is is it's an overused euphemism. Yes, yes. I work on my ego to keep it up. They do this and they keep doing it, and it's kind of like let it slide, dude. Yeah. You get on that set. You look the man in the eye. Plant your feet. Find your set. And tell him the truth. Get off your dead butt and tell the man the truth and mean it. Yeah. And I promise you, he's going to come back with. It. And it, it it has happened forever and a day. It really has. 
And I, that's why I say, again, I'm blessed. They've helped me immensely. I mean, do I steal from them? Absolutely. If you're going to, if you're going to take something that another actor does and does well, make sure he's the best. And when you take it, use it in that manner. And, you know, you can, you know, you can say whatever you want to say, but yeah, I, I borrowed from this actor. I borrowed from that actor, you know, and yes, and it, it meant some, it was that special. So all in all, I mean, it, it, I can't complain. I don't think most actors can complain. No, they say no. they never, st the interesting thing, if you ever get one, say, no, I never stole a line from anybody. <laughs> I know, come on. <laughs> they are so full of it. I want to hear someone say, I stole your tights when you <laughs> Oh, hang them up. These are tights. Um, <laughs> oh, well, Zach, can I give one one piece of love and, and maybe a redemption for myself for not having seen Roadhouse until recently. Uh, I loved uh, you, Fire... You got, no, you saw. You had seen yes, it. Yeah. You saw, you you saw been, Corey. Now I've seen it. The blessing, the blessing of the, the Roadhouse, whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did watch uh, Firebirds a lot as a kid. I love that movie for some reason. <laughs> you watched Firebirds? Yeah, I was like, I was like, I love that movie. I, I don't that know why. Theory. I mean, I loved it too. But I, I mean, I never hear people come up and say, "I loved it." So <laughs> but that's, I mean, you have such a large body of work that you know you've been in so many things. Um, but do you have do you have any memories uh, from Firebirds at all? Oh yeah, Tommy Lee Jones, seriously, yeah. <laughs> Nicholas Cage, yeah, <laughs> Sean Young, <laughs> pick one. Everybody. <laughs> I, mean, I, I will say this on Firebirds because I, I knew of, you know, uh, Tommy Lee and I knew that he hated talking acting, especially when a young actor comes up. Oh, you know, can I ask you a question about acting? Does this really mean this? And I just see him. You know, I, he just eats them. <laughs> he eats them. Sm small bites. I mean, he chooses them <laughs> And I mean, I went up, I mean, when I talked to him, I talked to him about fly fishing or throwing a loop, you know, or what, yeah. you know, cowboy, how's his cattle, you know, because that's what I want to talk to the man about. I don't care right. about talking about acting. We're here because we know what we're doing. If he does something and I dig it, well, you know, how many people do you know that you've watched in this business? And I'm just using Tommy Lee Jones as, as just a, a small part of it have tried to imitate the way he works. How many people have you seen try to get that timing down with their voice where they're copying what he does right. because his timing is so good? Right. Right. You know, it's just they do it because he's the best. He's not he's not got the greatest personality sometimes. Personally, I find him charming. <laughs> but I have other people say he's he could be such a butt. I said, Well, it could be what you ask him. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I it's mean, not him. Maybe it's it's the other it, common it denominator. Could be you. <laughs> <laughs> we had a guest on the show uh, about a year ago and and it said a very similar thing where he's like, you know, you spent more time talking about my music career than my acting career. And I said, Well, because we want to know it all. And, and I think, you know, with you in particular, Marshall, we want to know it all. Like, uh, it's not just about those amazing roles you've had, but who you are as a person. And clearly, you know, we, you painted a picture of yourself on our show that gives us this impression. It's fantastic. I love it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did. A, I did an album, by the way. Well, never, I want to get to that. Never, I want to I want to never put it out there. Wait, well, did, you never you never you finished the album, but you never put it out there. Yeah. Is it available to listen to? <laughs> no, no, I've got the tape of it. I've just never, never. I gave it to people to listen to some songs because I couldn't, I didn't have what it takes to go out and put a band together and go out and go on the road. Yeah, yeah. I cannot play an instrument. My hands are kind of, that's as straight as they get, you know, okay. so it's just that kind of way. But I, I just wrote these songs and I did it for years. And I had my friends, uh, uh, that listened to it and they said, you got to record this. I said, why? He said, because all you do is you sing them, they're beautiful songs, but record them. I said, okay. Well, I ended up going to the castle. You ever heard of the castle in Nashville? No. Well, it's it's a building what used to be, it used to be a gangster place back in the 
1930s or something like that where gangsters used to go there to cool out. And they owned this building and they turned it, eventually turned it into a soundstage. And we went there. We, we recorded part of it in, in L.A. and then went to Nashville to finish it. And I did it. And, uh, you know, so when people say, have you ever done any music? I can look at them and say, as a matter of fact, I have. I got, I wow. got, uh, yeah, I think I will. You know, it's uh, Tim Schmidt from the uh, Eagles. Yeah. Henry Paul, Henry Paul from the Outlaws. Wait, okay. Em, Emmy Lou Harris came in and sang with me. What? Yes. All the, uh, Henry Gross. He had a song called Shannon. He came out, he had several songs about it, but he came in and played with me. Everybody came in. I just, are you going to how long this? ago was this? Yeah. Why is it 1991? Come on now. What? Right after Firebirds. <laughs> <laughs> right after Firebirds. Exactly. Um, you got to get it out there. Well, it needs a lot of work. It was done on a four track. I mean, we went to Nashville uh, to the castle, you know, they put it on a big board where they had, yeah, yeah. I think it was 48, 48 switchers and they kind of cleaned it up, but it was, what I what they'd have to do now is to really go back and re-record it. Okay. And you know, and I I, I sang them, I sang the songs, I sang all of them. Emmy Lou Harris came in and sang the one I wrote for the. It's called Part of the Healing, and it's a song about uh, soldiers uh, soldiers going overseas. Oh man. You know, and uh, that was for them. And then a song I wrote uh, called BC Ferry, and that was a song about my time up in Canada doing a show, and a trip on the BC Ferry. Wow. going over to the island to have high tea yeah yeah so it was it was different songs about stuff oh marshall you gotta you gotta get this out there you gotta people want to hear this days. you Come gotta on, do it days. T- well tonight yeah <laughs> <laughs> well drop what you're doing well, do it tonight like that you just rip the throat out and nah. so that's how you do it that's how well, you get it done pitch yeah, that we... tent on the on the lawn of the releasing of the lawn of your mind and get it done <laughs> okay the lawn <laughs> of your mind i like well, that i gotta get my book finished first i'm writing a book right now so i'm finished that and I, i've got a couple of scripts that got out there I'm trying to sell them right now and i got a book that i'm writing it's kind of a sci-fi thriller oh cool and i and i've got about 185 pages written right now so what? i've got a, oh, okay Amazing. i'm writing that book and that it, it's you know it'll be out hopefully in next year or so do you have any uh sci-fi uh influences that that you really enjoy i dig sci-fi man Me you too. know you got to know that when you play talon yeah with a sword on your back with not on you know no blasters mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and they said, what kind of weapon would you like to use? I said, the sword. <laughs> the sword you gave me on the episode you brought me in on. I, I said, not that sword, but I will make a sword that will be his sword. And he said, you want to carry a sword? I said, absolutely. And that's the one thing about Talon that people know that I did the series Babylon 5. But that's the one character they know. They know Talon. He wasn't in it a lot. But when he was there, they knew it. So, right. you know, that, I mean, I, I did a lot of them. I did Star Trek. You know, I played a couple of creatures on that. One was a dinosaur and the other one was a, I forgot what they call them. It looked like a rhino, but, you know, but I, I played a couple of characters in that. And that was a blast to do. And just mm-hmm. sci-fi in general, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, Babylon 5, created by J. Michael Straczynski. I mean, he is a legend. Uh, You know, he was the showrunner on Real Ghostbusters, Zach, and everything. He's just, he wrote wrote comic books and stuff. Um, Yeah, I mean, he's a legend. And and Babylon 5 is one of the greatest. I mean, you know, he writes constantly. Yeah, He never stopped writing. He wrote almost every episode. He and another guy wrote almost every episode of Babylon 5. Did you were you able to actually like pick his his brain and everything on on oh, set? Well, I mean, when we did the first one, I think it was all alone in the night. No, no. I, well, I, no. I'm I'm talking about when when Talon came on or when I first did the show. Talon came on, yeah. When, when Talon came on, it was all alone in the night, and Bruce and I ended up doing a sword fight, a, a ring fight, like you know, back in Rome. We fought with swords and that kind of stuff, and. Uh, he said, you know, this just, first of all, you're my friend. And two, it's a shame for this character not to come back. Mm. 
somehow. So they arranged it. We went and talked to uh, Straczynski and, you know, and we talked about him and he said, well, what kind of, I mean, how do you see him? I said, I see him as an old samurai. He's a very, because you don't really know how old mm. Narn really are. Yeah. You know, they have some blasting red eyes, but you don't really know how old they are. So he said, I said, I want a sword. He said, well, I don't really have, I can probably find him. I said, no, 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 no. I'll make the sword. I'll have the sword made. I said, just, I'll make the sword. He said, you make the sword, I'll create the character. Deal. And then Talon was born. But Straczynski is very smart when it comes to that. I mean, it wasn't the first episode that I did that. I did the actual first episode of Babylon 5, and it was called Infection. And it was, uh, I don't know what he was. He was kind of an autonomous machine. He turned into that from the <clears throat> some artifacts that we you know stole from a planet. One connected to my chest and turned me into this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was kind of cool. Yeah. But it wasn't, you don't want to do every episode spending four and a half hours getting into a, a big 72 pound suit. <laughs> yes. <Right. laughs> yeah. yes. I mean, talking about, you were talking about uh, morphing uh, on screen earlier with, uh, you know, being a werewolf. Yeah. Wearing physical makeup is a whole other story. And the amount of time it takes to put that on and the process and the hours for it to look good. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, on on Babylon 5, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I would go in at roughly three o'clock in the morning. They would let, you know, makeup artists, the, the early shift. Yeah. Go home, go to bed because they had to be there at three to start to put this stuff on me for a seven o'clock shoot. So I was ready to shoot at seven o'clock. Wow. And the uh, first couple of days were a little rough. They didn't know about a cool suit and they didn't know how much it was going, how, what the temperature was going to be inside. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got hot. Trust me. I mean, they had to punch holes in my boots to let the water run out. Oh, I was in the, I was in that suit on the average of eight and a half hours a day. Oh, how, how much weight lost. did you, yeah. how much weight did you lose during that time period? Oh, 11, 12 pounds a day. Oh, that sounds gosh. about, yeah. Wow. Wow. 11, 12 pounds a day. I mean, I'd put, I'd eat, don't get me wrong, I'd eat and I'd drink, but <clears throat> you never had to go to the, the restroom because you didn't, nothing ever got to the bladder. <laughs> yeah. You're in suit, right. practically. You sweated this stuff off so fast, it wasn't even funny. Wow. But it was, it was, it was, another, it was a hoot. I mean, I did the first full body, here's another first. I, I hate saying this, you know? No. I did the first full body cast to make this character. Wow. I never thought I would say that. That's ridiculous to say. <laughs> well, that. it's not it's not like you're claiming that you were the first to utter a certain line in a movie like you were talking about earlier. So <laughs> you never stole any lines or something. No, I never stole any lines at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to claim first on some things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got I've got moves that I did in Roadhouse, you know, the thing with the hand, you know, or spin the stick and go, come on. Yeah. 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 That's the first time that had ever kind of been put together. And everybody's watched Roadhouse. And I mean, uh, the the Rock, I mean, who's, you know, I call him the Rock Johnson. Sorry. Yeah. Dwayne. Yeah, yeah. Dwayne's a nut for Roadhouse. He watched it all through college. And on his show, what does he do? Come on. <laughs> right? yeah. Bring it. You know? Bring it. Yeah. And a lot of other people have used it, you know. And But it's just having that move or thing that you do that nobody else has done. And it means that much that you know, people hook into it. Right. So when you see somebody else do it, my wife, always, he stole your move. I said, no, he did not. He borrowed it. <laughs> borrowed it. I love it. Right. This on. has been absolutely amazing. Seriously. Absolutely amazing. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you. It was amazing for me too. Cause I didn't know what I was walking into. I know you didn't. <laughs> so, do. so can, can we, can we, can I tell uh, Richard on Wednesday that, uh, that, you know, clearly, you know, he made the right call. You can tell Richard anything because Richard, will, he's not going to, he's going to give me crap about it anyway. Oh, yeah, you know? As he should. Like a so good friend. Just, you tell Richard anything you want to, but no, Richard's a great guy. Please tell him. Thank you. I will. From me because, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't know you guys without Richard. Yeah. You know, it means a lot. So Richard's 
pretty high up in my uh, my book, and right Judy on. is too. Um, Marshall, I hope that we get a chance to meet each other in person down the road one of these days. That would be a hoot. And, that uh, would be an absolute hoot. Thank you, guys. Thank Again, you so thank much, you. Marshall. Thank, thank you for you. your time, and thank you for your service, sir. Yeah. You're more than welcome for all of it. My pleasure. Thank you.